to uh, elaborate on the unconventional use of mobile networks. In particular, it will explain to us how to use mobile network as a remote sensing platform. So Marco. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the introduction. Um, so that's, that's precisely the topic uh, of, of my talk today, uh, using the network, the mobile network in unconventional ways. Um, so Paolo somehow spoiled uh, the, 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 the subject of the, of the talk, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> that's the problem. So uh, I guess that all of you are familiar with this kind of diagrams and you know, know very well what a mobile network is. Um, in a, let's say, very general uh, uh, definition, it's a telecommunication system where the last hop, the last link is wireless, huh? which allows devices uh, to be to be mobile um, and apparent and apparently uh, you know a, a very easy question is what's a mobile network for what do we use a mobile network for and if you look at uh, the kind of services that are supported by mobile networks uh, over uh, different generations uh, of mobile networks uh, you have plenty of different services uh, uh, we go from uh, uh, just plain analog voice services in the 80s with the first generation cellular networks, uh, through digital voice, uh, text messages, then web browsing, navigation, social media. Today we have video streaming and 5G is expected to bring many more services, including automated vehicles, uh, uh, augmented reality, and so on and so forth. Um, but my point here is that uh, all these services are uh, communication-based services, right? So those services are services that leverage the fact that through a mobile network you can bring uh, bytes or information from one point to another where one of the two endpoints or both endpoints are mobile. And this is what a mobile network is for. This is why we design and develop and build mobile networks, right? Bringing information from one mobile point to another. And uh, the, the you know, point of my talk is uh, trying to convince you that, in fact, mobile networks are more than that. You can do something that goes beyond the plain communication-based services. And you can actually use mobile networks as sensing platform. And to convince you of that, or try to convince you of that, um, I, I will discuss two different uh, use cases. Huh? where the mobile network is used as a remote sensing platform instead of something that uh, uh, allows you to communicate. The first use case is that of land use. Um, so I guess an introduction here is needed. Uh, what's, what's land use? There you have the definition that I got from Wikipedia. Uh, it's the total of arrangement activities and inputs that people undertake in a certain land cover type, which is a bit mysterious. I mean, it's not very clear. Um, but in fact, the concept of land use is very easy. Land use I is a map. No? You have a map of a region. In this case, it's uh, the greater uh, region around Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And you have a tessellation of space. So your region is divided into small areas. And you tag each area with one label. That is, just to zoom a little bit on the, on the legend, that is the kind of use people make of that piece of land. So you have red areas here, uh, dense urban fabric. Then you have slightly less red, that is uh, discontinuous urban fabric. You have green areas that are woods. Dark green uh, is forest. Uh, then purple is industrial areas, and so on and so forth. Okay? So you're basically saying what we use land for. That's, that's very simple. Um, and why is this important, uh, especially in urban areas, so city land use, urban land use, this is, uh, it's a very precious piece of information for plenty of applications. So urban planning, zoning, designing transportation systems, understanding demographics, understanding social segregation in cities, all those activities and many more need this kind of information. Huh? So here you have an urban land use map the, the meaning, the semantics is similar to the one I, I, I showed before for the city of Mannheim in Germany, and this is obtained from OpenStreetMap, so this is open data. Hmm. Um, now, how do people, well, geographers, in fact, uh, 
build or generate maps of, of land use. Um, the traditional ways uh, to do this uh, use census data, uh, use surveys, or more recently they, they use processing of satellite imagery. You know? uh, but there's no silver bullet. So um, there's no you know, ultimate solution out there right now that allows you to draw these kind of maps. And in fact, this is an active research field in geoinformatics. Um, and the reason why it is so is that uh, current techniques, all current techniques have drawbacks. So you don't have a perfect solution. Um, many of them are time consuming. So imagine you know, gathering data about you know, census data or collecting data from a survey. This is very time consuming and just capture uh, you know, a small fraction of the population. Um, this makes also the data easily outdated uh, because you carry out censuses maybe once every four or five years. Uh, which means that your map draw from that data is, is actually four or five years old. Um, then in case of satellite imagery, it's expensive, uh, of course, to collect this kind of uh, data, especially if you want uh, very fine grade uh, satellite imagery. Um, that's not available everywhere. So there's a number of you know, drawbacks. Um, and uh, this leads to a situation like this. This is the OpenStreetMap land use map in Turin, Italy, that is where I come from. And you can see all this gray area here that is basically 80% of the city is, is, uh, doesn't have any land use information. Huh? So it's missing information. Um, now, my point is that uh, we may want to try to use mobile networks to draw land use maps. Okay? Um, and the intuition is that uh, when <coughs> I, but generally speaking, people are at home, they use the mobile network in a given way. And when they are at work, they use the mobile network in a different way. And when they are, I don't know, having fun with friends at a bar, they use mobile network in a third different way, and so on and so forth. So we can build a link between the way people use the mobile network and the type of land use, the type of you know, use of the territory that uh, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, associated to a specific location. Um, so I'm not saying that, uh, you know, that you have to believe me right now, but uh, I show you that this, this can, can be done. Um, the, a very, let's say, straightforward way to, to, to address this, to try to explore if this is true and, and up to which point this is true, is uh, uh, to build uh, uh, mobile traffic signatures um, at different locations. So what we do is basically uh, imagine that you have uh, your region where you want to draw the land use map, and uh, you have a cellular network deployed in that region. Um, the cellular network has, a, let's say, spatial granularity that is uh, basically the, 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 at the antenna sector level. Uh, that's the, the best granularity you can get uh, uh, from the cellular network. So for each uh, antenna sector, or I would refer generally to location from, from now on, for each location, um, we can gather uh, uh, information about the mobile traffic. Um, what kind of information is up to us? Uh, the results that I'm going to show uh, use very plain aggregate uh, volumes of voice calls and text messages. This is the only thing we're looking at right now. So just the number of voice calls and the number of text messages. This gives us you know, a, an evolution of traffic uh, over time. Uh, we collect uh, this kind of data. We can collect, the operator can collect this kind of data for months. Uh, so you have a month long time series at each location. And then uh, um, the signature is obtained by uh, uh, compacting that, uh, that those months of, of activity over one week, as an example. Um, so that what you get is somehow a representation of the typical uh, activity of the network at that specific location. Um, then, OK, you, want, you may want to do some filtering of that, but in the result that I'm going to show, there's none. Um, but you want to do some normalization as well, because what we care about are the dynamics of the traffic. So um, you know, the evolution of traffic over time, and not the absolute volume of traffic. Because you may well have you know, two residential areas that are both residential areas, but have 
very different uh, population densities, and so you would have very different volumes of traffic, but the same dynamics over time. And what matters for us is the dynamics, not, not the volume. Um, so you want to normalize the, the signature in order to have something that is co comparable across locations. So let's say that we are able to, to determine, to, to compute those signatures for each location, then we can introduce some measure of distance between two signatures, so something, it's a similarity measure that tells us how two signatures are similar or different from each other. Um, and then we can run a clustering algorithm, a legacy clustering algorithm, in this case the results that I'm going to show uh, uh, refer to an agglomerative hierarchical clustering uh, that basically takes all the signatures and, and, and groups them and says, okay, those signatures are similar among them and those signatures are similar, but two groups are different one from the other. Uh, and then we can explore if different groups of signatures actually map to different land uses. So how does this work when we test it with, uh, with actual data? Um, uh, we collected data uh, from, from uh, uh, Orange and Telecom Italia Mobile. Um, overall, it's 10 cities in France and Italy uh, for a few months. Um, and uh, we computed this signature for each location in each city. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, computed distances between all those signatures and ra then run the, the, the hierarchical clustering algorithm. And we do not separate cities. So all the signatures of all the cities are together. What we get is something like this in terms of clustering. Um, this is a summary, let's say, representation where you have cities on the, on the columns and the different clusters on the rows. I'm li limiting here the, the analysis to the top 30 clusters, even if uh, we got uh, hundreds of clusters. So consider that here we have tens of thousands of locations uh, uh, in aggregate, on aggregate for all cities. Um, so uh, those tens of thousands of locations give us hundreds of clusters from the clustering algorithm. But actually, uh, only the first 30 are relevant because they cover from 75 to 90 percent of the, of the geographical area of, of each city. Uh, so those are the, the, the clusters that basically uh, cover most of the cities. Um, and, and this is good news because it means that uh, from tens of thousands of locations, I just get 30 relevant clusters. Okay, so it means that you have significant similarities across locations uh, in different cities. Um, and the semantic of the, of the, of the matrix is that uh, um, you have darker uh, elements where a cluster is very present in a city. So you can see here that the first cluster is really, really present in the first half of the cities and basically absent in the, in the other half. Um, Another interesting thing that we notice is that uh, the matrix is not uh, fully random. We can see patterns appearing, like you know, somehow a, a separation of the left part of the matrix and the right part of the matrix. And what we need to do next is investigate what's, go what's going on here precisely. Uh, so our first step is uh, uh, to interpret the result, is to, is to check the signatures. Huh? So if we take the first cluster, the one that is present in the first half of the cities, and we draw the typical signature of the cluster. So what we do here is we take all the signatures that are in this cluster and we compute the average of them. And you get something like this. No? So this is the typical representation of the dynamics of the mobile traffic, voice messages, uh, voice uh, calls and text messages over one week, uh, the typical week from Monday to, to Sunday um, for this cluster. No? So uh, the dynamics are here are not surprising. Uh, this is very, very standard behavior of the mobile traffic. You have night and day uh, that alternate. You have a peak in the morning, a peak in the afternoon, reduced activity in the weekends. This is, you know, I would say a, ver a very standard behavior for, for mobile traffic. Um, and this is, you know, for the first cluster, which is different from what you get as an example for the second cluster. Uh, the second cluster is somehow complementary to the first one because it's absent in the first half of the cities and it's very present in the second half. So if we do the same for the second cluster, we get something like this. Um, there are similarities, uh, but also differences, like the fact that you have a higher peak in the afternoon than in the morning, you have a different behavior on, on, on Sundays. Um, slight, difference, slight differences, I mean minor differences, that still are sufficient for the clustering algorithm to tell us those are two different clusters. Those are two different behaviors. Huh? So this is what the clustering algorithm tells us. Um, 
Okay, and we can do this for all the different clusters, and this gives us, you know, some idea of, you know, the traffic dynamics in each, in each cluster. But still, uh, it doesn't build any link between uh, uh, the traffic and the land use. Um, so to, to move for forward uh, in the interpretation of the results, another thing we can do is understanding, as an example, uh, you know, okay, this, this signature is uh, present in the first half of the cities, this signature is present in the second half of the cities, what are those? And if we check that, the first half of the cities is Italy and the second half of the cities is France, okay? So you find this a lot in Italian cities, you find this a lot in French cities, but you don't find this in Italy, you don't find that in France, okay? So we're starting to get closer to what we want. Um, we see that, uh, you know, mobile traffic dynamics sort of separated two cities, at least for the two first two clusters. Uh, but then we want to build, uh, to really build this link with land use. So to, to do that, uh, the only, you know, possibility we have is to, um, you know, run some time-consuming visual inspection process. So uh, as an example, this is, this is the city of Milan. And here I'm highlighting the, the areas, uh, you know, in purple, the areas that are covered by antennas. So the location, I would say, where we have this kind of behavior, okay? So I take all the uh, location in Milan that belong to the first cluster and I, you know, uh, color them in purple here. And this is what we get. Huh? So this is, since this is very present, the first cluster, uh, you know, uh, uh, covers most of the city of Milan. So most of the city is actually purple, uh, but then you have holes huh, everywhere in the city. And what we do once we have this, we compare these to land use maps provided by OpenStreetMap and check if there is a correlation between what we see here and uh, land use in, 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 uh, in the OpenStreetMap data. And it does. So this maps very well to residential areas, okay? All residential areas, areas that are mainly, you know, occupied or used by people to, uh, with their homes in a way. Uh, that, that's, that maps very well to those, to those regions. And that's not only Milan, it's all the Italian cities. So we name this the, the signature, the mobile traffic signature of residential land use in Italy. And actually this is the residential land use signature in France. So when people are at home in Italy, they tend to use the mobile network with this weekly dynamic. When they are at home in France, they tend to use the mobile network with this weekly dynamic. And the two are not the same. Huh? And let's say the, the reason why they are not the same is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, those are sociological reasons uh, for which I don't have an explanation and which are a little bit out of the scope of the, of the talk. But, uh, uh, you know, when, when Italian people are at home, they have this dynamic. When they are at home in France, people in France are at home, have these different dynamics. And I need two different signatures to detect land use, residential land use in Italy and France. But the good news is that we have a mapping between uh, this, this behavior and land use. And uh, this is not just for residential land use, it's also true for other land uses. So uh, if we look at the third cluster, the third cluster is instead, you know, the same. Uh, it's present in, in all cities uh, across Italy and France. So while the first two clusters sort of split apart Italy and France, the third cluster uh, brings them together. So you have this kind of signature in many locations, both in Italian cities and French cities. Uh, and this now looks very different from what we had before. Um, you have no activity on the weekends, you have no peak uh, on, on the afternoon, you have you know, a reduced activity, let's say, earlier during the day. Um, and by doing the same process, we can also map these to land use. So maybe I want to make this a little bit interactive. Do you have any suggestion on, or guess on which kind of land use this could be? Offices, very well, okay. It, it makes sense because you have no activity over the, over the weekend. Uh, apparently people tend to use them by network more in the morning than in the afternoon when they are maybe a bit tired. And this is you know, an example of the process I was mentioning before of coloring areas uh, with, uh, with obtained from the mobile network uh, with this uh, uh, signature and overlapping that to, to um, areas that are offices, uh, uh, um, 
enterprise headquarters uh, provided by OpenStreetMap and checking, you know, if there is a, a match between the two. Um, we have nice or, well, interesting, as I, as I said, I mean, there's hundreds of clusters, 30 of them are relevant. Uh, mm, if we look at this uh, cluster, this is found just in one city that, by the way, is Paris. And, uh, but it's very present, present. You have almost 300, you know, uh, locations where this occurs. And it's a very peculiar behavior with high peaks in the morning and the afternoon, smaller peak at noon, no peaks or no relevant peaks in, in, in the weekend. So that's, that's also maps very well to one land use. Do you have any guess? Transportation, yes, we can be even more precise than that because these are subway stations. So there's 95% precision and recall with, with subway stations. So all subway stations and only subway stations in Paris have this kind of behavior, which is commuting, right? Early in the morning, late in the afternoon, and so on and so forth. And this is semantically similar to another cluster that we find uh, across all cities. Uh, this, is, this is in all cities, but you just have between one and five different locations in each city that have this kind of behavior. Mm? Still, it's, I mean, semantically similar because you still have a peak in the morning and one in the afternoon, but the peak in the morning is much reduced. Any guess? Still tra transportation related, but you just have, you know, between one and five of those train stations, huh? That, that, that maps to all the train station in each city. So at train station, you have this behavior. Again, there's the difference between train station and underground. It's a sociological matter to investigate why it is so, but what I can tell you, you know, from an engineering point of view is that you have this kind of behavior. Um, and okay, just one last example. Um, there's, there's this cluster that is very present uh, in, well, fairly present in, in uh, um, French cities, and it's not present in, uh, in Italian cities, and it's characterized by high peak on Saturday uh, and no activity or very small activity on Sundays. During the week, you have a standard behavior, I would say. Um, so you're not French, I guess, but uh, if there's some Frenchman uh, among you, he or she would easily tell you what this is. Um, so in France, malls and commercial centers are closed on Sundays. And so you have people going there on Saturday and you know, not going there on Sundays. So those are French, French malls. Huh? Uh, and I'm just you know, giving you a glimpse of the, uh, we, what we did was interpreting all the different clusters and giving, uh, associating each cluster to uh, one land use. Huh? Um, but of course, all these, uh, here you sort of uh, um, I'm asking you to believe me, huh? uh, and what I'm telling you is that, okay, we, we got uh, uh, the, the, the land use maps from OpenStreetMap, and we compared visually to, to the signatures, to the areas where we have a given signature. So, okay, you have to trust me on that. So, uh, uh, what we lack here is a proper validation. So, checking if uh, what we get from the mobile network is actually uh, uh, the true, uh, true land use information. Um, and to do this validation, what we did was uh, getting uh, ground truth information from municipalities of Milan and Turin. So we got land use maps from, from the two cities, and those are not open street map, uh, 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 you know, open source maps. Those are commercial, high detail uh, maps that the cities use uh, to do all those things I was mentioning in the beginning, urban planning, zoning, designing transportation system, and so on and so forth. So we can trust them in a way, or at least Milan and Turin municipalities trust this kind of maps. And uh, what we do is uh, we use this as ground truth. This is our you know, term of comparison. And then uh, by just using the mobile network data, now that we know the land use associated to each uh, signature, we can draw a mobile um, land use map using the mobile network, right? So I just look at the signature that I have at each location from the mobile network, and I label each location with, with one land use. And then I compare that map that is obtained purely from the mobile network with this kind of ground truth uh, information. Um, so we have a, actually it's a comparative evaluation because we evaluated multiple uh, solutions, but the one with the Hashika clustering I introduced at the beginning is the one that works the best, is the, the orange uh, bars here. 
This is an F-score of coverage and entropy that are two matrix that uh, tell us how the two maps uh, 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 match. Uh, the higher the value, the better the match. Um, and, uh, uh, okay, results are disaggregated across uh, land uses, so as to see if we have better or worse results depending on the land use, but the results are pretty consistent across all land uses, so we can detect uh, with the same level of quality all, all land uses. The two plots are for the cities of Milan and Turin. Uh, the question is, how do we perform uh, in absolute terms? And the answer is not, not too bad. Uh, the F-score is between 0.6 and 0.8, which means that uh, uh, the maps that are obtained from the mobile network traffic are, uh, I would say, decently precise. Um, and uh, uh, they cannot be probably used you know, to replace land use information, but uh, uh, what you get from, from mobile network traffic is fairly close to the actual land use. Um, what's important is that when you go and look at the gaps between uh, you know, uh, what we get from with the mobile network data and uh, the ground truth land use, we find out that in part uh, the, the error is due to um, well limitations of the mobile network data. So mobile network is not designed to, to, to do land use uh, map making, right? But, and so mm, you have, as an example, uh, many cases where your antenna uh, sector uh, covers an area that is fairly large, and in that area you have multiple land uses. But then what the Hashika clustering does is it labels that area with one land use, so you have an error there that is limited. Uh, this is due to the limitation of uh, the granularity, geographical granularity of the data. But what's interesting is that uh, in many cases, it was the opposite. Like, we got the correct result from the mobile network data why the ground truth was uh, wrong. And uh, the reason why uh, uh, that happened is that the, the ground truth we got from the municipality of Milan and Turin uh, dated back to 2011. And, you know, the reason is uh, what I was mentioning at the beginning, collecting this kind of data from censuses and surveys and satellite imagery takes time, is expensive, so municipalities do this every now and then. And we, we did this study in 2016, and the most recent data we could get from Milan and Turin was, was from 2011. While the mobile network data that we used came from, from that same year, it was 2014, 2015. Um, and between 2011 and 2015, uh, the cities changed. Okay. So uh, uh, an example that I like is the one of, uh, that I think is very clear, is the one of the Expo area in Milan. So in Milan in 2015, they had this World Expo, uh, and they built a whole, you know, neighborhood dedicated to that uh, in the outskirts of the city. And in the ground route, that area was a rural area because in 2011 there was nothing there. But in our data, that was an entertainment area because, you know, that, that was it was uh, in 2015. Um, so my point here is that, uh, you know, there's an error here, but part of the error is actually due to the fact that uh, uh, this, this kind of land use maps obtained from mobile network uh, traffic, they may be used uh, as a complement uh, to traditional land use map making, especially if you want to keep your maps up to date, which is something that is very hard to do with traditional techniques. So uh, let me just uh, tell you about a, a, a different ways to do the same thing. Uh, again, so the focus is again on map, uh, land use map making, but I'm going to use a different uh, approach that is based on exploratory factor analysis. So I would skip, uh, well, mathematical is a big word, but um, the, 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 the equation, fundamental equation of EFA, just give you in the intuition. What EFA does is that uh, given a, an area, a region, that it is tessellated, uh, again, those could, can be areas covered by antenna sectors, as an example. Those are the location from a mile network. Uh, we name each location a variable, and uh, then for each variable we have a time series. Huh? And each uh, time instant is a sample in the EFA problem. What EFA does is that if I feed a properly calibrated uh, EFA problem with this kind of information, time series for each uh, location, um, EFA will tell me, will return a small number of uh, common factors that are typically you know, uh, uh, dynamics of traffic. Uh, here I'm showing things over one week. Um, such that 
by using those common factors, I can explain the original uh, behavior at each location. So um, I, I feed the EFA with, uh, with the original time series at each uh, location. EFA returns common factor such that uh, the original time series at each location can be explained as a linear combination of those common factors. So the mobile traffic here at this location is ac actually 60% uh, this behavior, 10% this behavior, 20% that behavior plus some noise. So we have common factors plus uh, something that is uh, uh, specific to this location that is removed uh, from the common factors. And uh, um, the point is that uh, these may well map to land uses. And to check that, um, we, we are here, I'm just considering the city of Paris, um, where, uh, consider again a few months of data uh, for each, for each uh, antenna sector, and uh, by feeding uh, uh, the time series of each antenna sector uh, to EFA, we get 14, 14 factors. And now, do these factors actually map to land uses? Um, let's check. This is a map of Paris where I'm highlighting antenna sectors, or let's say coverage areas of antenna sectors, uh, so location, um, where I have a high loading of the first common factor. So I take, I take the first common factor, I check where that common factor is important, huh? uh, explains, where it explains between 60 and 90 percent of the overall uh, time dynamics, and uh, 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 I, I highlight those areas here. So yellow is 60 percent of the behavior is explained by this common factor, 90 percent uh, is, is red. Okay? Um, so now this is these are the cells where you, I have this, uh, this uh, specific common factor, this specific time, dy time dynamics. Does it map to a land use? Yes, it does. It's offices. And in fact, what's nice is that if I compare this with the results from the hierarchical clustering I showed you before, we have very, a very good match between the two. So these are office areas obtained uh, by the, the hierarchical clustering, and these are office areas obtained by EFA. And the fact that we have this match is, is nice because it means that uh, uh, it's not an artifact of the methodology because the, the approaches are completely different. They have nothing in common, uh, but it's really something that, that's in the data. And we find again, you know, all the signatures I, I discussed before, just a couple of examples, subway stations, railway stations. This is again something we find in those factors. So we have one factor that explains subway stations, one factor that explains railway stations and residential areas and so on and so forth. Uh, but in fact, EFA, uh, or this second approach, is much better than the first one um, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, it just gives us 14 factors, while before, if you recall, we had hundreds of clusters. And this is much clearer because uh, uh, those are actual land uses, while the hundreds of clusters, are, a few of them are land uses, but then you have more things that are you know, specific behaviors. Um, uh, one important thing is that uh, here, in order to build this match, here I'm, I'm considering three different clusters of the hierarchical clustering um, together. And the point is that uh, what happens with, with the hierarchical clustering is that uh, the hierarchical clustering has to put one label on each, land, on each uh, antenna sector, on each uh, location. So uh, what the clustering will tell you is that if a location um, behavior is explained uh, at 60 percent by an office behavior, it will put that into a cluster. Then another set of regions has a time dynamics of the mobile traffic that is explained at 80 percent uh, by, by um, uh, an office behavior, it will be a second cluster. And then where you have 90 percent of the behavior that is explained by uh, um, an office behavior, that's a third cluster. You see, like, it splits apart different percentages of the same land use. While EFA just tells you, hey, look, this is all the same. This is offices. Just you, have, you just have different intensities of office presence. And uh, uh, this is important because um, it allows you to detect mixed land use. So before, again, one location was one label. So one location is offices. And that's it. What the clustering, uh, uh, the Yashika clustering algorithm is going to tell you is that the prevalent uh, land use there is office. But EFA will tell you that, in fact, the behavior that you have in a given region is 60% offices, 30% residential area, 10% subway. Okay. So 
in the example I was making before where you have a, um, a coverage um, area that is too large and uh, covers multiple land uses, well, with the Azure cluster, you just pick the most uh, popular land use. With EFA, you have a split among land uses. So you can say, even if the area is large, you can say that 60% of the behavior there is, res is residential, 30% is office, and so on and so forth. Okay. So you have a big advantage, and you can build this kind of mixed land use, di this event diagram that for all the city of Paris, we're, we're, it represents basically how residential office and short commuting, that is basically subway, uh, uh, land uses overlap. Uh, and this is something that is very important for, again, urban planning, uh, but it's very hard to, to uh, estimate it by using, you know, standard techniques. Um, okay, let me go quickly through the second uh, use case. Now we are not talking about land use anymore, we're talking about population density, so fairly different topic, uh, which is probably more uh, understandable uh, since the beginning. So population density is basically the number of inhabitants per square kilometer, no? number of people per square kilometer. Um, there you have fancy map of land use, uh, sorry, use, uh, USA population density, um, less fancy map of population density in Uganda. Uh, so this is, you know, inhabitants per square kilometer. Um, why is this relevant? Uh, again, probably not, not to uh, uh, telecommunication engineering, but uh, for everything that is urban planning, transportation planning, economics, geography, sustainability, having this kind of uh, uh, population density, especially in cities, so this is uh, New York, is uh, uh, very important. And how do geographers estimate population density today? Well, you have, again, national censuses, population registers, surveys, which are, again, very time consuming to collect, uh, are, are often outdated, uh, they are unreliable and unavailable in many countries, especially in, you know, like uh, uh, developing countries, this kind of data is not really available. Um, and uh, it's an active research field, exactly as uh, for, for land use. Um, and recently, uh, this is the current state of the art, uh, there was a breakthrough um, from, from Facebook actually. Uh, they used uh, deep learning on uh, very high resolution satellite imagery and they could fully map uh, population density in 23 different countries at a very uh, high level of, of precision. So, you know, squares of 100 by 100 square meters, something like that. Uh, okay, why Facebook is interested in this, uh, it escapes me, but, you know, these days we learn that Facebook is interested in, in many things we didn't know. So, uh, they, they will have their own reason for that. Um, but this is, this is the current state of the art. Huh? And this is, this is about static population, like where people live, no? uh, inhabitants, per, or dwelling units as they are called, per square kilometer. Um, now, you, you may guess that what I'm trying to do now is using mobile network to estimate population density. Can we do it? Yeah. Um, actually, this is something that has been known for the past uh, uh, three, four years. Um, there's a well-known uh, power law relationship between population density and traffic uh, volume. So the, the, the population density here, rho, is a power law of the traffic volume. Here you can use whatever you want as traffic volume. Uh, uh, you have a decent correlation with the uh, voice calls, text messages. I'm not showing it, but there's also internet traffic, uh, incoming, outgoing. This is log-log scale, so it appears as a, as, a, as a linear relationship, but it's in fact a power law. Um, what we found out is that the correlation is noisy, so you, you do have this power law, with, but, but with a lot of noise. The correlation is better if we, instead of considering directly this data, we consider subscriber presence, that is a rough approximation for uh, uh, the, the number of users in a given location. So I'm not going through the details because I don't have time, but uh, um, this is, you know, estimating the, the number of users at each location in a very, very simple and, you know, error-prone way. Still, you have a better approximation than those you have here. Um, we can denoise the noise a little bit, the data, okay? Okay, skipping through this, but in the end, we, we remove, you know, uh, outliers, and what we get is something that is more, more accurate. 
and overall uh, you get a decent estimation quality. You, you can approximate, you can understand from the mobile network um, the population density with, I would say, you know, less than 9% error. No? Uh, and you can also get models that are reusable across cities. So you can train your model in, in Milan and reuse it in Rome and still you have around 10% error. Okay. Um, now, all this is about static population density. So I'm looking at where people live where they sleep at night somehow. Um, and this is easy. Uh, you, you, you can do this pretty well with, with mobile network data. This has been known for a few years, that's fine. Now the challenge is dynamic population density. So if you think about it, population density is a time behind phenomenon. Huh? So with traditional data, even the Facebook state-of-the-art approach, uh, we can capture long time scale dynamics, like popula how population changed between 2000 and 2010, right? or in, within a few years. Um, there you have you know, diagrams of a few cities in, uh, in, in uh, the US where they show how people changed between 2000 and 2010. Blue is growing population, uh, red is decreasing population. So you have Detroit, the economic crisis is striking, and people moving from the city center to the outskirts because the life is cheaper there. Or you have Las Vegas expanding you know, uh, uh, amazingly fast, or New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. You can see these kind of behaviors. But those are very long time scales, like uh, year-long time scales. And in fact, if you think about it, population density is much faster than this. If you think of what happens during a day in a city, you have people moving to the city center to work, then moving back home, then going somewhere else. So the, the density of population over the urban area changes at time scales that are not years. They are minutes. Huh? And you will never be able to track this kind of fast or short time scale fluctuations by using satellite image. Huh? Um, however, guess what? Mobile network metadata has this kind of granularity. By looking at what happens in the network, you can, you can check, you can track population density at every minute. So you can actually understand how people move in the city within a day. As an now the challenge uh, to, to arrive to the point where we have this kind of dynamic population density estimation is that we don't have any ground truth. So what we did for the static case was saying, okay, I have my ground truth, that is the census data, I know where people live, and I, I, I train this power law. I, I find my, co my coefficient alpha and beta of the power law by, by doing simple, simple linear regression. That's it. Um, in this case, we don't have any ground truth anymore because we don't know where people are during the day. Huh? So we cannot train the regression model anymore. And we cannot just say, OK, I'm going to use the same alpha and beta that I computed uh, for with, the, with the static population over the day as well, because this is erroneous. Like, uh, you, you, have, you have a very bad correlation over, over that time. Here you have midnight to midnight, one typical day. The correlation drops, let's say, uh, during the day, because people are not at home anymore. Your census is not a valid ground truth anymore. Um, so the way uh, we, we did this dynamic population estimation was by introducing a, a multivariate relationship. So finding a way to uh, write alpha and beta as, <coughs> sorry, as function of something that we can monitor over the day, and specifically the activity level lambda. So what's the activity level? It's simply how much people use the network over the day. So you have midnight to midnight, one, one, one day, let's say, one typical day. This is the number of calls per person average calls per person, and you can see that uh, overnight the activity is very low, and then over the day you have, you know, again, standard activity, and then it, it gets again uh, lower towards midnight. Um, and this is the activity, what we call the activity level, huh? how much people use the network. Um, the question is, can we write alpha and beta as functions of this lambda? Um, to do that, we can trust the night, night time. That is to say, at night time, I have my census data, that is uh, correct. I can assume that the census data is correct at night because it tells me where people live. So what I can do is train different uh, um, power law models using linear regression overnight, you know, over those hours between midnight and, and 5 a.m. where I trust my ground truth. 
and I get slightly different alpha and betas at every 15 minutes, let's say, okay? So here I train uh, one model, another model, another model, another model, and I check how alpha and beta vary. And since lambda is changing slightly during that time, I can write alpha and beta as function of, of lambda. Question is, does a relationship between alpha and beta and lambda exist? And luckily, it, 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 it does. So you have here the logarithm of alpha, and, and here is beta directly. Here it's lambda. And you can see that uh, you have, these are different cities. Um, each, each uh, let's say, set of points is a different city, but the behavior is the same across cities, or it's comparable. You have this uh, exponential relationship between alpha and lambda, and linear relationship between beta and lambda. So I can actually try to write alpha and beta as functions of lambda, okay? And lambda is something that I can then measure over, over the day. So my, my exponential, my power law uh, function becomes something like this. The, the, this is the dynamic population density. It's still a function of my mobile network metadata, so presence in our case. And, but then instead of alpha and beta, I have two functions of, of lambda, okay? And this means that I can compute uh, the population density over time by using the presence metadata and lambda that are both measures that I can get from the mobile network at any instant in time. Now, does this work? Because, uh, okay, I, I, I'm, what I'm doing here is training my model here and assuming that it works also there, right? Um, in order to validate this, uh, we need to find some ground truths that we can use uh, during the day, that we can use here. And uh, the way we did it was by using sport events attendance. So, uh, you have sport events, and you have information by, provided by the organizers about how many people attended the, 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 work, the sport event. So that's a ground truth. Uh, that's, a, you know, it's, it's a sporty ground truth. We just have a few events uh, over, over the time, but still, uh, at least at those points, we can sort of validate, validate uh, our model. Um, so what we did was collecting all football matches uh, in, uh, in uh, all attendance, let's say, in numbers, attendance figures, uh, of football matches in, uh, in Turin, Milan, and, and Rome that are our three, let's say, uh, target scenarios here. And uh, we compute the error between uh, the actual uh, attendance and the attendance that we get from our multivariate model. And what you get uh, is typically 10% error. Okay. So again, it's not perfect. We didn't expect it to be. But uh, it's uh, fairly or decently, decently accurate. Um, and it does better than, than other solutions that were proposed before. Um, now that we trust, let's say, our model uh, with a 10% uh, margin of error, uh, we can check what happens because then the model is something we can use you know, at all times. So we have, as an example, four months of data in Milan. I can estimate the dynamic population in Milan for four months with, uh, you know, an accuracy of 15 minutes, as an example. At every 15 minutes for four months, I can estimate what's the population density. And so we can see, by doing this, we have videos, you know, that, that show uh, the commuting pattern. That is something that you expect, people getting in, getting out, uh, and so on and so forth. We can also see, you know, social events. You can really visualize, I don't know, people here gathering in the center of Milan for a, for a public march, and then, you know, progressing through the city to the main square, uh, Piazza del Duomo, uh, as time goes on, and then dispersing around the city. And we can also estimate the number of attendees at these kind of public marches, which is interesting. In this case, you know, the peak uh, 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 at attendance was at 37,000, uh, which is interesting because when you get figures, you know, for public marches, especially politically oriented ones, from, from uh, uh, organizers and public authorities who typically have one order of magnitude of difference. So this, this can actually shed light on what's the actual atten attendance at, at an event. Um, but those are just examples. So you can really, whatever kind of, uh, you know, uh, information you want uh, to extract that has to do with dynamic population density, you, you can get it from this kind of, of, from this kind of thing. Okay, so let me, let me uh, wrap up. Um, so I hope I sort of convinced you that with mobile network uh, data, we can 
estimate land use, uh, especially keep it up to date uh, and estimate mixed land use. Uh, same for population density estimation. We can complement static population density uh, and obtain dynamic population density. That is something that we cannot do otherwise today. Um, but those are just two examples. Huh? So uh, I didn't have time for more, but my takeaway message is that you have many more use cases. And then this means that somehow mobile networks can be used, can be useful for something that is not, well, plain uh, communication-based services. So I, I'm not saying that communication is not important. It's that, that's, you know, the, 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 the cornerstone. But then uh, we have that infrastructure. Let's use it for something more as well, since it's so useful for them. Um, mobile networks have unique features. So they are probably the most pervasive infrastructure man ever built. And uh, collecting data from mobile networks has basically no cost. Um, all the uh, use cases I mentioned were, were, let's say, using aggregate data, but potentially mobile networks give you the possibility of uh, monitoring individuals, which is very important for some use cases as well. And the level of spatial temporal detail that you have in the data is, you know, more than sufficient uh, given the scale at which, at you, at which you measure, measure things. Um, What's the current status um, in this sense? So using mobile networks as remote sensing system, there's a growing community that is grow that is you know developing around around uh, this topic. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary community. Uh, there's, there you have a couple of surveys on on the topic, um, and operators are sort of you know fueling the community with uh, with open data challenges. So uh, this also demonstrated operators start to think about that. Uh, you know, they, they understand, they start to understand that the mobile networks, okay, they have a value for communications services, but they also have a, a, a very uh, high economic value, added value for something that is not just communication. So they are starting to spend money on uh, evolving their networks in uh, ways that they can be used for monitoring and sensing. So it's really deploy deploying probes uh, uh, for that. Uh, and this is this is now. Telefonica just released their fourth platform. I don't know if you are aware of that. It's basically a whole new department of Telefonica whose business is how to monetize metadata from their mobile network. Huh? So this is precisely the kind of things I, I've been discussing uh, until now. Uh, Orange, they even have their own service built on, uh, uh, this is a population estimation service population density estimation service that they are, you know, developing, they, they have developed, they are selling now to tourist offices, municipalities, uh, retailers, to let them understand how many people are at a given location at a given time. Uh, and they, they are selling, it's a proper service. Um, and well, okay, there is, a, I think there is a, a common, let's say, uh, uh, direction with also pure networking goals. So, uh, nowadays, we, we, we talk a lot about cognitive network management, that is managing the network in a self-organized way, automated way, by using measurements in the network. So I think that there's a, you know, a convergence there, because in both these cases, we use the network as a sensing platform, and in these cases where you want to collect data for network management, you have you can reuse, let's say, the same, uh, the same uh, measurements. You can use, reuse the same props. So for operators, that's a win-win situation because it basically they do two things by building one infrastructure. Um, and then what, what will happen next, but this is you know, mere, mere speculation. That's my, just my take. Um, uh, so uh, the, the use cases I showed you, those were using voice calls and text messages. So it's really the most basic kind of information you can get from a wild network. But even in current 3G, 4G mobile network, you have plenty of metadata that is not exploited at all. So operators have, have it there, but uh, they don't use it. And that's wasted money, basically, for them and wasted knowledge for us. Um, so I'm, just to give you a, a, an idea, uh, this is the time series, the weekly time series of uh, snapshot use. So one specific mobile service in, in France. Um, and again, this is just speculation. But uh, you see that there is a peak here 
at 10, 10 a.m. in the morning. So what if by studying this kind of behavior, so not just voice and text, but going deeper and looking at individual uh, mobile services, we could, as an example, detect that these peaks are due to the fact that students at school have a pause, right, at 10 a.m. in the morning, so they start uh, Snapchatting. And uh, what if by comparing different usages of Snapchat, we could tell apart different types of schools or different uh, social classes of related to the schools and so on and so forth. Just to you know, give an idea that uh, uh, I don't have any proof uh, that that's the case, but just to give you an idea that uh, the results that I showed you use uh, very plain information and the net in the network we can get much more detailed information that we're not using at this time. Um, and then maybe uh, you know, a more, even more controversial point is that uh, uh, as telecommunication engineers, we may start thinking about uh, uh, changing our mindset. And so maybe for 5G now it's too late, but beyond 5G or beyond, beyond 5G, why not starting designing mobile networks in a way that, of course, they support communication services, fine, as they always did, better and better communication-based services, but what about designing the mobile network so that they are also designed since the beginning as remote platforms? So imagine a system where a mobile network, pervasive mobile network, that covers 99% of the population, that allows you to localize users I don't know, yeah, millimeter away or whatever, at the scimitar level uh, precision, accuracy, uh, that allows you to track the position of those individual users uh, at very high frequency, I don't know, every 100 milliseconds. Um, and this is done in near real time. So you basically know the position of everyone on Earth with a decimeter level accuracy in real time and uh, you know exactly what he's doing and what he's there for, etc. So it's like, you know, minority report kind of scenario, which is a bit scary, huh? but uh, uh, this is something, you know, that can be achieved if uh, we design the mobile network for that purpose. And uh, again, there's plenty of issues with privacy and so on and so forth, but uh, it also opens or paves the, the road to plenty of new applications Imagine the kind of services that you can develop if you have this kind of information, okay? And this, I think, it's a huge opportunity for mobile operators, and uh, uh, let's see if they, they seize it or, or not. Um, okay, so that, that concludes the talk. Uh, thank you very much. I just, uh, uh, there you have, you know, papers where if you want more details on, on the things I discussed, and more importantly here, you have websites where you can get uh, um, the code and some of the data that we use uh, for, for our studies if you if you're interested on that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, any question for uh, for the speaker? Okay, I I have one. Yeah. Uh, regarding this this last part that you mentioned about the future uh, uh -huh. work. Uh, Basically, what, what you are saying is that if you are adding more feature to the to the data, so you can have finer granularity, more accuracy, and so on and so forth. Uh, but what about the, the methodog methodology that you are using? This is also increasing the complexity of the of the method that you can use. So maybe also the methodology there is important because if you're using one approach, you can extract some feature that are not enough to describe the right. the phenomenon. So. In that sense, I, I feel that there is also uh, quite a lot of room for uh, yeah. I mean, for us as engineers to work on. Definitely, definitely. The, uh, the methodology is all to be defined. So, you know, like these kind of things, uh, clustering algorithms, uh, spectral analysis, uh, even simple linear regression, that's, that's the starting point. But then, uh, uh, as you have more and more features, uh, um, and you have more and more complex solutions to analyze data, you know, deep learning to name one, then, then there's a convergence there. And I mean, using maybe deep learning techniques, the deep learning techniques we have today for this kind of purposes is a bit risky, I feel, because 
you don't know, you know, that, that's the issue with deep learning. You don't know what, what the algorithm is doing precisely. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's the way. I think the, there's a convergence between uh, mobile network engineering, since we know the mobile networks and we understand how they work and we understand the kind of dynamics you can have there, and data mining in the end. Um, so th there's a need of interacting between uh, the, two, the two communities, um, which doesn't mean that we, are become, we could become useless, uh, because still they, they, they want to be able to understand the results without our competencies. But yeah, so uh, actually uh, my own research is moving towards, towards this, this kind of activity, like data mining. Then a, a curiosity more than a question is that, I mean, y you are moving a bit uh, from the typical uh, mm -hmm. telecommunication uh, yeah. research field. So how is the interaction with these other uh, actors that you are playing with? So the municipality for the land use and they hey. are... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's complicated <laughs> uh, because, uh, first of all, you have to interact with operators because they have the data and that's very time consuming, it's a process where they give you very little data, you show you what you can do with that data, then you, they give you, if they like it, they give you a little bit more, and, and so it's a matter of building a trust, uh, you know, relationship with the operators, um, which is not, not easy uh, and takes a lot of time. Um, then you have, I mean, interacting with municipalities is easier, uh, but still, uh, we don't speak the same language, so maybe uh, you know it's, there's, there's a need to to make them understand the value of of uh, what what you do, uh, and then there's the interaction with the people who do data mining. That's also not straightforward because you know they, they run their algorithm, they come back to you and they show you, hey, look, there is this uh, very nice correlation, but something that doesn't matter at all. For you, I, I have an, 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 an example there. Um, um, that's not me, but a, co a colleague of mine. He, he um, wanted to use uh, neural networks on uh, measurement data uh, in, in uh, uh, let's say, core internet networks. And you know, they discuss, he discussed with those guys who do data mining. And in the end, after a few months, they came back to him and told him, "Hey, look, we found that there is a very strong correlation between." Uh, um, what was that like? The throughput and the number of acknowledgement that you get back from your receiver, and you know, like you don't need months of data mining to understand that. You just need understanding of the protocol, and you already have the results right away. So you have this kind of issues when you interact with them. And the most difficult thing for me was talking with sociologists, you know, because with the results, then I wanted to understand, as an example, why there is a difference in residential area mobile network usage uh, in Italy and France. So you go and talk with sociologists and you have to ask the, the question in 10 different ways because every time they, they don't get it and in the end you get an answer because they say yeah we know that there is a difference but uh, and they write you one page with nothing in I mean I, I'm an engineer I'm <laughs> I'm expecting yes no number you know something like that but no you, you get uh, a lot of text and <laughs> it's very hard to grasp the meaning of that so yeah, it's it's tricky, but I I guess that's the that's so ap what always happens when you have interdisciplinary research, and it's also the enriching part of it. You know, like uh, it's complicated, but it's fun. Yeah. You, you mean us or? Well, we have contacts with, with Orange and Telecom Italia, so Italy and France, basically. Um, now we're starting talking a little bit uh, with Telefonica as well. Uh, but as I said at the beginning, it's really a matter of getting to the right contact inside the company and convince them that what you do is not, to, is not, is not going to uh, breach privacy, as an example, because, they, of course, they are, they are very worried about that. Um, and then you also need to show that what you're doing is meaningful for them. Uh, they can make money off of it. Uh, uh, so so that, that the limit is really imposed by who you know 
within mobile operators. Then if you look, I mean, there's, there's this very strong uh, uh, research group at MIT uh, from Carlo Ratti, um, who, who are also analyzing you know, mobile network data. And since they, have, they are MIT and they started working on this 10 years ago, they have contacts you know, everywhere in the world, and so they have this very nice nature of papers where they study you know, 10 different countries. It's a matter of contacts. In and I mean, those, those data challenges, those are very good opportunities to start building a, a contact with, with the operators. But uh, uh, yeah, those are not uh, very, and there's one, one, one challenge per year, more or less. This year there was one from uh, a Turkish company um, yeah, if you, I mean, that's a very good starting point. Yeah, so, right, uh, th that's a good question. I don't think I have the signature here. But yeah, so green areas, generally speaking, uh, are, are uh, well identified. But it's, it's urban, so urban green areas. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, woods or forest. Then I, I cannot, because we only focused on cities, I don't know what's, what's going on there. I, I mean, I can assume that there's very little traffic. But you still tend to have patterns, uh, you know, depending on when people go there. Um, it's, uh, it's surprising uh, how well you can characterize location based on mobile traffic. It's, um, you know, I, as I mentioned, we just had, I mean, we consider the top 30, you know, clusters we got with the Hiroshima clustering. But then, of course, we also, just out of curiosity, we went and looked at the, the remaining clusters to see if we had something specific. And then you can see that, uh, uh, of course, stadiums, as an example, they are classified by very specific signatures. And Different stadiums have, have different signatures because maybe you have, you know, one one city where you have the the the, the local soccer team that plays uh, Champions League and another city does not. So you have two different signatures because you have big uh, mid midway through this week or not, um, and you have maybe I don't know one specific, very specific signature was that of St. Peter's Square in Rome where you have a huge peak uh, when, when the Pope uh, gives uh, his talk, these kind of things. So, um, I don't know, I was surprised myself of uh, how well, and those are not land uses, you know, because St. Peter's Square, you just have one in the world, so. Uh, but uh, I was really surprised of how accurate you can be when, when you look at, at mobile network traffic, especially when you aggregate over several months, you have a very nice signature, basically everywhere. Um, coverage maps. Ah, you mean uh, coverage of each antenna? Yeah, uh, that's a very good point. Uh, uh, so, from the mobile operators, we could not get any proper coverage map, um, and uh, um, actually, in the Telecom Italia, and this is why I mentioned, you know, I was talking about locations, because um, in the Telecom Italia data set, the operator had already post-processed the data, so they had uh, sort of hidden the coverage of each antenna by, um, uh, let's say, uh, building or, or designing a grid, a regular grid on the city, a very fine-grained grid, and uh, associating a, a given amount of uh, mobile traffic to each uh, cell of the grid. And, you know, they started from the, the coverage and then they did some pro post-processing to just assign uh, a, a value to each, uh, uh, to each uh, element of the grid. Um, and that was the granularity we had. Um, in the orange case, they just gave us the traffic per antenna sector. So there, in order to estimate the coverage, since we didn't have any, you know, received signal strength uh, information, whatever, um, our our take was just to consider a very simple Voronoi tessellation of space based on on antenna locations, uh, which is very rough. 
we can't do better with the data we have, but still, considering the results we had, um, I think it's a, it's a good starting point. Then, of course, if we could have proper propagation maps, then the results would be even better because you would be more accurate on which is the coverage of each antenna. Um, so, so, you know, uh, the, let's say that the point is that those results refer to a case where we are approximating the coverage in a very rough way. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, cool. um, save, save this.